All right, we are just a couple minutes after the hour, so why don't we get started? Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, this is our big ideas for our energy future session on inactive wells uh, with Marla Ornstein, Keely Cameron, and myself, Julie Roll. Um, so I'm the animator of the Energy Futures Lab. Um, I'm pleased to be your host today. And uh, if you haven't been to Energy Futures Lab events before, we encourage you to turn on your uh, camera if you're able. I know many people are still at home and there's the usual disruptions of kids and pets. Um, and all kinds of things. And so no worries if that's happening in your world, but we'd love to see your faces and be able to connect with you all today. So today we're meeting virtually. Um, and so we're spread across this great territory. Um, however, I'm in Treaty 7 today. So I'd like to offer the land acknowledgement for my region. If you know the land acknowledgement for your region, please take a moment to recognize the land that you sit on now. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot First Nation tribes of Siksika, the Pakani, and the Kainai, the Stony Nakoda First Nation tribes of Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley, and the Sutina First Nation. The city of Calgary is also homeland to the, to the historic Northwest Métis and to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So I wanna give a big thank you today to Calgary Economic Development. Um, they've sponsored today's session, as well as two of our previous sessions, one on carbon capture utilization and storage, and one on workers in transition. And today um, we're going to be using Slido for our session. Um, so if you have questions, um, we'll be asking you guys a bunch of polls. So please, um, we recommend that you join Slido on a mobile device if you have one handy, um, or you can also open up another browser and go to slido.com. You can enter the code inactive wells um, to join us for our session today. So I'd like to give you guys an overview of who the EFL is and what we're doing here um, with this session. So the Energy Futures Lab, uh, also known as EFL, is a consortium of approximately 70 innovators from across the energy system we're all working on creating the energy system the future requires of us. So back in March, when COVID first hit, there was a lot of talk of economic recovery. And so Alison Cretney, our managing director, along with Chad Park, the founding director of the Energy Futures Lab, wrote an article titled, Five Big Ideas for Alberta's Economic Recovery. These are ideas that are coming out of the Energy Futures Lab, and they included hydrogen, geothermal energy, bitumen beyond combustion, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as lithium. The article got uh, great response. And so as a result, we hosted two public events similar to this one on Zoom, featuring EFL fellows with, ex with expertise in those fields. So as a result of the success of that event, we decided why not showcase a number of the great ideas coming out of the Energy Futures Lab in these public sessions. So. Today, um, you're here for Inactive Wells. Our next session is on energy transition in the arts with Mark Hopkins. Uh, that one's not to be missed. <laughs> that will be very exciting. September 29th, we'll have Steve Saddleback join uh, a conversation for truth and reconciliation within energy development. And then on October 13th, we'll be discussing e-mobility with Megan Lohman. So please visit our website and social media to learn more about all these sessions and all the work going on in the EFL. So I'd like to turn it over now to Marla, uh, who will give us a little bit more context as to why we're here today. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, we're here to talk about the problem of repurposing inactive wells for new energy uses, what this is about, why it's been a problem, who's working on it, and what movement is happening. One thing that I find really interesting, um, and I don't know if we can turn off the, uh, the slides for a minute so we can just see faces while, while we talk about all this, but um, thanks. Um, I, I write and work a lot on various energy and environmental issues, and it has been stunning to me how many people are interested in this, how much response I've gotten, gotten and how many people have been reaching out on this particular topic compared to almost any other topic that I work on. We've clearly really struck a, a chord or a nerve with this. Um, I was also shown by the fact we have 86 participants on board. So we're hoping that we can provide some value today. What, what we're hoping you will come away with today um, is an appreciation of the scope of the problem and the uh, scope of the opportunity as well, 
an understanding of how you yourself might fit into the picture and how we might align our energy to addressing this topic. What we're going to start to do is uh, introductions first. We're, we're going to introduce the, the presenters. Um, I see somebody has a question on what the code is for Slido. So Julie, maybe you can jump in with that as well. Um, but also we're gonna encourage you to use the chat feature to introduce yourselves to one another. I know that a lot of people are very eager to hook up with others who are working on this topic. So if you want, just tell other people who you are or why you might be interested. And if you want to share your contact information, feel free to do that in the chat. Um, so I'll go first with the introductions. My name is Marla Orenstein and I'm with the Canada West Foundation. We're a public policy think tank, uh, independent and nonpartisan. And I work on issues having to do with natural resources. So anything that, that is in the bucket of energy, water, land, forests. Um, and we're interested in this topic because we think it's, it's one of the building blocks that's critical to uh, the prosperity of the West. And, and that's our whole mission. Julie, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm Julie Roll. I'm the animator with the Energy Futures Lab, which is really about taking ideas that are on paper and bringing them to life in the real world. So it's a super cool job. Um, my background's in geology. I worked as a geologist for an oil and gas company for a number of years. And four years ago, I actually left to create uh, my own company called Regenerate Alberta. And the whole idea of Regenerate Alberta was, um, what if we could think about uh, the downturn uh, as an opportunity instead of a disaster? And so what if we could find new ways to reuse and repurpose the things that oil and gas companies were leaving behind? That included the people, the equipment, the material, the infrastructure, and transform them into solutions for tomorrow. So the idea was born out of watching um, the movie, the, the Big Short, and how uh, those folks turned the mortgage crisis into a, into a money-making scheme. So my, uh, my angle on this was, how can we turn this downturn into a money-making scheme? And so the work that I've been doing since then has been really focused around that. Um, that's kind of my background. I'll turn it over to Keely. Hi, I'm Keely Cameron. I'm legal counsel at Bennett Jones. Prior to my current position, I spent 10 years as legal counsel at the Alberta Energy Regulator. My last four years was spent on liability management issues, and I was counsel for the regulator on a number of insolvencies, including the Redwater Energy Matter. So having spent a number of years trying to find ways to address inactive wells and liabilities and keep them from going to the Orphan Well Association or to taxpayers, um, I see this as an elegant solution to help diversify the economy, create new jobs, and actually convert what some companies view as currently liabilities to assets for other companies that can help ensure landowners get paid, municipalities get taxes, and that there's actually a purpose to these wells and sites while we wait for them to eventually be abandoned and reclaimed. Okay, great. I think we're gonna launch into our first polls for the audience and continue introducing yourselves. It's awesome to see all these names popping up and, uh, and who everyone is and where you're from. So it's great. Okay, so first of all, we're, we're interested to see kind of the cross section of folks um, who are here today. So why are you, uh, why are you interested in this challenge? Um, you'll be able to see um, the, all of the options on Slido if you go there. Um, there's a few of them that are cut off here as we look at them on the screen. This is interesting. Julie, do you have a prediction for what do you think is gonna, gonna be the, uh, the top interest here? Uh, well, I was noticing a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who I know of that want to use the sites for, or wells for something else who are on the line today. So I was thinking that might be a dominant uh, group yourself. I, I wouldn't be surprised at that. I know that there's a lot of people who are just banging their heads against the wall with frustration on this issue. And a lot of them are, are the ones who are, are trying to repurpose things. But, but I'm also thrilled to see how many people are here just interested members of the public because it's certainly a, a topic that's getting a lot of attention. 
Yeah, definitely. It seems to be slowing down. Maybe give it another 15 seconds or so. Yeah, this is great. I'm, yeah. I'm also surprised and delighted to see how many interested members of the public there are today. So that's wonderful. It's hard to know who, who we're tapping into in our various articles and posts on LinkedIn. You know, are you staying in your own echo chamber or are you getting out of that? So it's awesome. Okay, should we move to the next one? Sure, let's do that. Okay, so wondering why people feel the topic's important. It could be important to you. It could be important in general. You can check as many of these as, as you care to. So Marla, what's the top reason for you that this is important? Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's going to be the taxpayer liability one, but uh, well, at least that's my, my pre-guess. I mean, I always came at it from an economic prosperity uh, perspective. Um, so for me, that's, that's a big one. I think uh, Keely is in the background cheering for the ARO answer. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like a lot of people are seeing this as, as a really key element to the whole energy transition and diversification. Um, what, it's part of our path forward. We need to take the assets that we have today and be able to repurpose them for what we need to use them for tomorrow. And, and so I'm not surprised that that's the answer, but, um, but it's interesting to see how strongly that's coming out. Yeah, definitely. Well, it, it's a nice thing too, because it's kind of a, the, the positive spin, whereas the risk of taxpayer liability comes from a, more of a, a negative or a fear-based place. Um, so it's, it's nice to see that people are landing on something where we, where we can be forging that positive future. Mm -hmm. That's All right. Another 10 seconds for anyone to respond. Last minute votes, get them in. All right. Now we've and got for the record, we may wind up putting out just a little one pager on, on what the answers are to the various polls that we're having along the way. So, um, you'll be certainly, uh, notified when that comes out as well. Okay, great. So now we're going to take the next uh, 15 minutes or so to talk about the landscape of what's going on right now. And, and there'll be a bit from, from me and from Julie and, and from Keely on this. Um, while we're doing this, you can also use Slido to ask questions or to upvote other people's questions. Um, after we, we get through the, the, the talking heads part of this, we'll, we'll be getting into those questions and trying to answer them as well. So highly encourage the, the use of Slido for that. So Julie, over to you. Tell us what this is all about. Yeah, you bet. So I know there's a number of experts on the call, um, but I also know there's a number of members of, pu of the public on the call. So I wanted to make sure we were all grounded in um, the life cycle of a well. And so just kind of clarifying what happens and in what order. So the life cycle starts out with exploration and drilling. So you need to figure out where to put the well uh, then you have to do all the preparations to actually get ready to drill it, get the license, um, prepare the site, all of those kinds of things. Finally, you drill it and complete it. Then you get into the production aspect, which is where the money's made. That's where you're making back your money. Um, and over time, wells start producing less and less product. So that means that they start becoming uneconomic. And largely, um, this happens uh, fairly quickly for some companies that have um, large overheads. And so typically um, what's happened, especially in Alberta, is that at that point, um, when, a, when a well or a field has declined to a point where it's no longer um, profitable for a company, they'll sell it to a often smaller company that has a lower overhead um, that can squeeze the last remaining production out of it. Once there's no more production left or it's uneconomic, you need to abandon the well. Now this term is used um, improperly in uh, most of the literature that you see coming from um, just the general kind of public. Abandon often is referred to as walking away from a well, um, but in this case what I mean with abandoning a well is actually pouring cement down the hole, cutting off the drill pipe or the cement, the casing, uh, and then you won't see it anymore on the, on the landscape. After you've actually properly abandoned the well so that no more oil or gas or water or anything can come out of it, 
you need to go into a stage of reclamation. Sometimes that involves remediation, but essentially it's getting uh, the land back to its original land use capability. <clears throat> so it needs to support the same use that it did prior to being disturbed. Um, so whether that's grasslands or forest or agricultural land, um, reclamation is the last stop. So if we go to the next slide, the problem here is that liabilities in Alberta's oil and gas industry are accumulating very steadily. So the graph on the next page will show us how this problem isn't a new problem. This is a problem that's been building for many, many years. Um, the graph shows from 94 to 2016 and uh, the inactive wells and the growth uh, of those over time. I've added a green bar and you can't actually see the number at the top because of the hashtag but it's, um, we're currently at about 90,000 here in 2020 in active wells. And where are these active wells? Well, on the next slide, you'll see they're everywhere. <laughs> so the current 98,000 inactive wells are spread all the way across Alberta. All right, next slide. Um, and we have drilled a lot of wells in Alberta. So there's currently 98,000 that are inactive, um, but the, this chart shows that we've actually issued licenses for almost 610,000 wells in Alberta. Um, I'll break it down by chunks over the next couple of slides. So the first one in the next slide is the wells that are closed. So about 134,000 wells in Alberta have been closed. This means there's no more work left to do on them. They are either rec certified or rec exempt um, and you probably wouldn't even know that they're there. I'm actually looking at one directly out of my window. They're going to turn it into a park for our community and you would never know except for those three little stakes in the ground so the construction crews don't dig it up that it's there. The next section of the pie are the wells that have work left to be done. So 475,570 is the number of wells in Alberta that have closure work left to do. Um, so that's, um, that's ranging, some of those are still producing. Uh, many of them are producing, especially the ones in the blue and yellow would still be producing, but anything in the purple and green um, aren't uh, making any money anymore. So this is kind of looking at uh, what Alberta has to deal with in the coming years as uh, these assets age. So the next slide. The problem with this is that it properly addressing liabilities is extremely expensive and time consuming. And uh, so we'll go through what some of the ranges of costs and apologies to all the RecRAM experts out there who are cringing at this slide. Uh, I'm married to one and so I know how much uh, anxiety this can create <laughs> to average a number. Um, but essentially, the abandonment downhole work can cost anywhere from around $50,000 to $150,000. These can be upwards of millions if things go really wrong. Um, and takes a few days, maybe, maybe a week. Um, remediation is not always required on sites, but um, when it is, it can range from around $10,000 to $500,000. And of course, up into the millions if things go really wrong. Um, reclamation uh, is around uh, 10,000 to 200,000, somewhere in that order, probably often on the lower side. But the key to reclamation is that it takes a long time. If you need to ensure that the proper vegetation is growing and the site is put back to the way it needs to be, you need to make sure that you're monitoring that for a number of years um, to make sure it's come back properly. So um, <clears throat> I've shown you the ranges. A good average for the province is somewhere around $200,000. Now keep in mind, there's not very good transparency on these numbers. And so that number, like we said, could range from 60,000 to millions. Um, but if we take an average of 200,000 and spread that across the wells that need abandonment all the way through reclamation, <clears throat> that gets us $76 billion. So those are the wells that uh, Alberta still has open. Like I said, many of those are still producing, but over the, the lifetime of all of those wells, $76 billion if we were to do this the traditional way. Well, I can't imagine the boom coming back in a way in which we're going to invest $76 billion into something that doesn't make us more money. Um, 
And so my idea here is that we need a different way of approaching this. So our goal on the next slide is to create a pathway to enable current liabilities to be converted back into assets so that we're not just spending all this money um, that's, uh, that's out there in the system uh, to get uh, it back to the way it was. Let's spend the money and uh, create something that can actually generate more revenue for us in the future. So I'll turn it back to you, Marla, for the next part. Fantastic, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about who's been involved in working on this, pro this problem and then what some of the activities that have actually happened. So next slide, please. Um, as we saw in, in that first poll, there's a lot of diverse interests, all of whom have, have some angle on this problem. Uh, in my mind, there are sort of three buckets that, that people's interests cluster around. The environmental liability and making sure that, that things get cleaned up and that the financial liability that's associated with it comes off the books, as well as making sure that, that the integrity of the environment is maintained. There's the economic opportunity both the economic opportunity writ large in terms of producing energy, producing a commodity that people want, and also the jobs that come along with it. And then there's the concept of energy transition and diversification, taking the assets that, that we have and repurposing them for a, a, a different energy future. In some ways, all the different groups that are listed here, government, landowners, unemployed workers, new energy developers, reclamation and other services, the general public, cities and asset holders, everybody has an interest in all three of these to varying extents and, and for, for um, different personal goals to come out of it. But these in my mind are, are why people are mostly interested and who the buckets of, of interested audiences are. There's also a number of other organizations like PTAC, the Orphan Well Association, Energy Futures Lab, and we ourselves, the Canada West Foundation, that um, have been taking an active interest, not because we stand to profit from it, but because uh, we think that, that it's, it's a key to unlocking a number of different elements that, that we also want to see happen. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk for a minute about what some of the traction has been. We, we know some of the frustrations and what the problem is, but there's actually been some movement in this area as well. Firstly, there's a couple of things that have gone on from the government side. Um, during the whole COVID recovery and lockdown announcements of, of where funding was going, the federal government said that they would be assigning $1.7 billion uh, to clean up orphan and abandoned wells. And the way that they worded this didn't exclude um, repurposing, and it wasn't just about orphans, uh, it was about inactive facilities so, so that um, the breadth was there to, to enable this to, to happen, although we don't actually know if any of the money is really going to go for it or not but certainly that intention had been staked out. Um, within Alberta, uh, there's this new liability management framework and we see K Kitty's uh, photo next to that announcement and she'll be able to talk about it far better than I can. There's a number of different projects that are starting to, to see some success in doing things. Renewal has been all over the news over the last couple of weeks in terms of a solar project that they're putting in on abandoned sites and that they've actually been able to um, get the agreements in place to actually allow this to occur. So that's very much uh, an example of a positive outcome and the type of story we'd like to say could be typical if this problem is solved right. Um, I think we also have Adam Robb on the, the uh, line here today, so he, he might be able to explain it better, but we, we also know that there's a project going on, this one involving high school students who are going to be looking into this problem as well and, and trying to bring that into their own curriculum. Um, it's an issue for landowners and there are agreements starting to be, to be made uh, as farmers want to be able to use um, the idea of repurposing these sites to continue to provide an income stream when um, facilities are, are no longer providing one from their, from their old activities. And one that I think is, is really interesting, and it's the bottom right one here, um, there has been a, an interesting initiative led by Millennium Environmental Services with um, bringing together PTAC and some of the major energy incumbents and the cities of Calgary, Edmonton and Medicine Hat and a number of others to work on what they're calling low probability receptors. They're trying to develop a, a framework, basically a matrix that they can give to the Alberta energy regulator that will provide the scientific basis to support uh, the regulator being able to say these types of sites 
have a very low probability of environmental damage by repurposing them. And, and, and here are the different types of purposes that would be appropriate for these types of sites. So it would be um, a really strong evidence base that would allow the regulator to make um, sensible decisions that are in the, the public interest without placing anybody or anything in jeopardy. So I'm, I'm really interested to see what they continue to do. So those are some of the things that are going on right now. And I'm gonna turn it over to Keely for about five, five or six minutes or so. Uh, in fact, you can even have a bit more um, to talk about what's going on uh, in terms of the legal framework and, and what's helping to enable or stymie progress on this front. So Keely, over to you. Thanks, Marla. So we could talk about the legal challenges and framework probably for hours. And the legal risks and challenges do vary based on the current state of a site proposed to be used and how that site intends to be repurposed. But one of the largest risks or challenges is really around environmental liability. And environmental liability is so important not only to garner stakeholder support, it also impacts access to capital, um, the terms upon which uh, regulatory approvals will be granted, and it can really impact the economics of a project. So we've already talked a little bit about why one would want to repurpose a site, but from the new technology um, repurposed company's perspective, one of the key advantages is it minimizes the overall environmental foot footprint while helping to convert this existing liability. But one of the challenges for the existing oil and gas company um, in terms of entering into these arrangements for repurposing is currently in Alberta, there are no timelines for carrying out abandonment and reclamation. So what that results in is a need to work out an arrangement into who will take the necessary steps to carry out what abandonment or reclamation needs to occur prior to um, reusing or repurposing the site, as well as how that environmental liability will be apportioned between the parties, both on a historical basis and a go-forward basis, recognizing even if a site's fully reclaimed, there may be additional work that needs to occur going forward. So it's really um, working out that initial arrangement in terms of who's going, what work needs to occur, who's going to carry out that work, and on a go-forward basis, who will maintain or take on those obligations. Now, in terms of picking a site um, for carrying out these activities, Again, ideally, um, one of my big focuses has historically been how to keep things out of the Orphan Wall Association or else get things out of the Orphan Wall Association once it's come in. And there's currently a lot of um, rub points or challenges with getting assets out of the Orphan Wall Association through the AER's regulator directed transfer process. And one of those issues, for example, is first of all, um, the AER can't actually provide title to the assets on the site. So there becomes challenges with what do you do with the existing infrastructure on that site? And then if you're looking at becoming a new licensee for the purpose of these projects, you may be required to post full security for the existing environmental liabilities even though as a new company coming onto the site, you weren't responsible um, for that liability in the first instance. As a result of some of these challenges, it can be cost prohibited for a party to become a new licensee for these sites. So what I've been seeing is companies looking at taking on or using somebody else's licenses and working as a part in a partnership with existing oil and gas companies. But with that, it can cause your own legal risks and challenges because then you're dependent on that licensee's solvency and their compliance with the regulator in order to use the site for a go forward basis. So again, it comes back to the importance of structuring your contractual agreement with that party and having a clear understanding or agreement with the regulator. 
And then one of the other big challenges, other than those contractual challenges, is the current regulatory regime is so oil and gas centric. So first of all, when you're looking at repurposing these sites, you have to understand which is the appropriate regulator. So the Alberta Energy Regulator, their focus is really on oil and gas development, and even their definition of wells is tied to that development. So unless you're producing as part of your hydrogen or lithium some residual gas with it or other oil and gas products, you run the risk of whether or not you actually fall into the AR's regulatory regime or whether you fall under Alberta Environment and Parks and kind of need to understand what the various requirements would be depending on the streams that you fit in with. And also understanding if you are going to fall into that oil and gas category, making sure you understand how the regulators will be risking the sites and what liability management frameworks will apply. Because again, using the AER's liability management framework, their asset value is attributed to oil and gas production. So if that's not the main production or value from your site, you're likely going to have a negative liability management rating, which will require um, providing and payment of security. And then also if as part of your, um, your project, you're looking at generating electricity, it's also important to be aware of current restrictions on the ability to provide electricity to the grid. There is currently a review going on by the Alberta Utilities Commission, which is likely something that parties should be aware of if as part of their project they are looking at producing electricity. So this is just again a summary of some of the risks and challenges that should be considered when looking at developing these projects and while what we're seeing and what we're hoping people will take away is there is a lot of potential and advantage in pursuing these opportunities there are also a number of barriers and challenges that need to be overcome to make such projects successful on a larger scheme. And I'll also just mention that it's important to look not only at what's happening in Alberta, but if you look at Saskatchewan, they're actually a lot further ahead than Alberta is in terms of not only repurposing sites, but also encouraging these types of developments in the first instance and have a number of grants available that can also be explored. That's great. Keely, thank you so much for that, that explanation. That, that was very helpful to me, certainly. Um, before we go ahead to, the, to our, our next section, I actually have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you and Julie. And the first question is, is around who owns this problem? Uh, within the Alberta government, is this just an AER issue or, or what are the different department or agencies that are involved within the Alberta government that, that each own a piece of this? Sure. So in Alberta, it's actually the, the Alberta government is the one who sets policies and requirements for both, um, whether it's Alberta Environment and Parks, who's the main regulator for environmental issues and then the Alberta Energy Regulator, who's the regulator for the oil and gas side. So while you often hear about the AER and the orphan well problem and inactive wells, what the AER does is they really implement policy direction that comes from the government. That said, if you look at historically the approach that's been taken to this issue is people commonly refer to the polluter pays principle and the idea that it's polluters and industries problem to solve. But my personal view is it's an issue that all stakeholders have a role in and a position to be involved in to try to solve this issue. And looking at the Redwater Energy decision that went to the Supreme Court of Canada and really looked at environmental liabilities and who should address them. If you looked at the participants in that proceeding, you had support from indigenous groups, landowners, municipalities, industry, and environmental groups all working together with the government and the regulator, trying to ensure that 
liabilities are getting addressed at the end of the day. Fantastic. Great answer. Julie, do you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Or she said it all. Yeah, I think, I mean, she said, she said that uh, most of it. And the other piece that I want to kind of make clear is your, your slide on, you know, who cares about this problem and who's interested in this problem was a beautiful simplified version. Um, when I mapped out the stakeholders uh, of who all has been involved in this uh, topic in the last four years that I've been paying attention to it, um, I think I had 60 different bubbles on this whiteboard that I was drawing out. And so I think what's interesting, your question was, whose problem is this to own? Um, Keely did a great job of explaining kind of everyone. Um, and I think what's great, what, that, what's actually great about this is that everyone's coming at this from a different angle. And so um, what the EFL is trying to do is to try and assemble a number of those different stakeholders that have all those different perspectives to try and put a bunch of those pieces of the solution together mm -hmm. into this pathway that can actually make it happen, so. That's great. Mm -hmm. and, and one more question to the two of you before we move on. Um, we keep hearing about this as an Alberta problem, but we're not the only jurisdiction that has inactive facilities or abandoned wells. I know, Keely, you were talking about Saskatchewan maybe having a different time, but there's Saskatchewan, there's BC, there's Newfoundland, although that's mostly offshore, there's, uh, there's Oklahoma, Texas, the Dakotas. Um, is this a uniquely Alberta problem? Are all the other jurisdictions also grappling with this exact same thing? Or is there something about how um, either liability or the framework has been set up in Alberta that's caused it to be a problem here in a way that isn't elsewhere? So I, I've looked at this issue actually around the world and everybody has problems. It's the nature of development is when times are good, people want to encourage companies to focus on producing and expanding development. And when times are bad, there's no money left to clean things up. But what I think is unique to Alberta is we have an amazing opportunity through this repurposing because Alberta is so plentiful in terms of its resources, right? We have helium, we have hydrogen, we have um, lithium, and then also we're a great province in terms of our ability to generate electricity through solar wind, um, which just makes Alberta potentially better suited um, to pursue these repurposing than some other other jurisdictions, though we are seeing it in other jurisdictions, whether it's California or Saskatchewan. Julie, do you have anything to add? I do not. Okay, wonderful. Well, we, we've talked about our own perspectives on this issue, but one of the really great things about this webinar is we have this assembled expertise of, of now 90 participants that um, all of whom have, have different types of experience. So we're hoping to harness your expertise um, to help frame what you think the problem really is and what should be done about that. So to that end, we have a couple more um, poll questions. I wish we had the time for a really robust interactive discussion because I, I think I would love to hear what, what some other people have to say, but maybe we'll have a chance to get into that during the Q&A. So can we ask the next poll question, please? Um, there's a lot of challenges to this repurposing of oil and gas sites. Um, are we able to see them all on the screen here? Or you'll certainly see them all on Slido. Um, what do you think, you can choose two, what do you think are those biggest challenges? And you could choose two each. Keely, any bets on uh, what's going to come up as, on the top here? Certainly the paying for existing liabilities is a, a big problem. I would say like two years ago, the challenge was getting anybody to listen or to even talk about the, the idea. So we've come a long ways <laughs> now that we're talking about it. The, the, the financial liability, the environmental liability is certainly coming out very, very strongly. I know uh, perhaps for a future seminar, Julie's had some really interesting ideas on, on what can be set up as, as innovative 
financial instruments potentially to to address that very issue. Definitely. Well, and this also helps us focus our efforts, right? Um, if we know what folks are most concerned about, we can focus around those topics and um, mm -hmm. dig into them a little bit deeper. Yep. Okay, another 15 seconds or so. We've had 47 people answer so far. Interesting that, that a lot of it really is coming down to the financial side, the money side, as opposed to the environment itself. I know this is one of the um, things that the, the low probability receptor project was working on is helping the AER be able to credibly provide um, the, the data that would help it show that it's not um, doing harm to the environment or, or to environmental receptors or people. Um, but for this crowd who's here today, it's really more about this, this intractable financial responsibility issue. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Just how important is solving this problem? We've certainly seen that a lot of people are interested, there's things to be done, but there's a scale of, eh, this is a tiny thing or it's a huge thing. Where does it land for you? In the world of problems. I know that this is going to be slanted towards uh, the importance because everybody bothered to show up because they thought it was important, <laughs> but nonetheless. That's fantastic. And uh, just while this poll is finishing up, I know that we're going to take the next 10 or 15 minutes for questions and answers or uh, other types of discussion. Sonia, just so I know, do we actually have any questions that have been put forward so far? We have a couple. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, because I'm not seeing them in Slido myself, so I can't. Hell. Yes, well, hopefully folks have some nice stuff now, but I will give you, um, there's a question, are, are we, we're good? You want to start? We're good. Some? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so a question for Keely, if a business places assets on a pro producer's inactive well site, what are the implications for the business if the producer goes bankrupt? Yeah, so there, there's a number of challenges there. Um, one of the largest ones is the agreement could get canceled through the insolvency. You could lose access to the site during an insolvency. And then also depending on how the agreement structured, if you're using the insolvent company's infrastructure, you could lose access to that infrastructure. So it's really just ensuring you have clear contractual agreements and where possible, especially when insolvencies are involved, um, regulatory approvals um, to help back up those agreements so that you don't run the risk of losing access to a site if the licensee becomes insolvent. Awesome, thanks Keely. Um, Marla, do you want to, I just see that you addressed Mark's question there or his, his puzzling. Um, would you like to address that? Um, I, I would rather than actually address it because I'm not the expert here, I will sure. bring up his questions, however, um, which is a, a really good one, which is how the hell did we get here to begin with? Um, it, it would seem that when you're digging a well, you should know that it needs to be reclaimed and set enough money aside at the beginning for doing that. If so, wouldn't this problem just take care of itself? Um, I, I think um, I'm going to leave it to more experts than me to answer what the, the system was for, for um, in a very basic way, I think it's everybody planned to use their future profit to clean it up later and maybe didn't save enough. Um, and, and we can get more into that later. But I do see that there's sort of two separate things going on here. One is the liabilities problem of how do you get to the point where there's outstanding obligations that simply can't be met. But even if those, those reclamation obligations were met, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of saying there's, uh, uh, rather than reclaiming, it's smarter to use this site as it is and repurpose it for something else. We don't want you to bring it back to native prairie grass just so that we have to strip it down again. We want to use the infrastructure that's there because there, there's something, but yet there's blockages in that way. So um, I think that there's sort of two points there. One is how do we get into this outstanding liability issue? And the other is even if we got rid of that, would it solve the repurposing problem? So Julie or Keely, do you want to have a crack at that? Mm, I might give it a first go on the first part. <laughs> and then Keely, um, you could add to it. And, so, and before you do that, Julie, there's another question that's been thrown in here that, that might be a good way to start it, which is, could you please explain the difference between an inactive versus an orphan well? Sure. Sorry. Yep. 
So an orphan well is a well um, that uh, the company has gone bankrupt. So there's no um, company that's currently operating that's responsible for managing that well. Um, it could be in any state, it could still be producing, it could be abandoned, um, uh, but it's not yet been reclaimed. Um, so those, the number of those has been also steadily increasing. I, uh, I had a slide on that, but I didn't want to overload you guys with too much data, but um, that, that inventory of orphan wells has been increasing a lot more just due to the number of insolvencies that have been adding up over time. Um, so yeah, essentially you got it right, Marla. Um, the intention would have been to use future profits to um, pay for reclamation and remediation and abandonment. Um, and part, I mean, it's a multifaceted problem. There's lots of reasons that that happened. One is um, a lot of wells lifespan could be um, 50 years or so. And so 50 years ago, uh, they didn't set aside or didn't properly account for um, uh, the cost that it was going to be in $2,020 to clean up these sites. Uh, and is that just an Alberta thing? Is that just how Alberta was structured or is, is that the same in other oil producing jurisdictions? If you yeah, know. so in other jurisdictions, there are timelines. Uh, so once a well is done producing, some jurisdictions have a timeline on that. So you need to clean it up within six months to a year kind of thing. And Alberta currently doesn't have timelines. So um, the expectation is just that you get to it someday. Um, and so I think the day of reckoning has come more quickly than a lot of companies anticipated and the cost of cleaning up has been bigger <clears throat> than a lot of companies anticipated. Keely, do you wanna add a little bit to that? Sure, so, so just adding to that part of the challenge, again, um, because Alberta has had no timeline, so there's an obligation, you have to clean up your site at some point, but no timelines for when it has to be done. And in Alberta with a, very few exceptions, you're not required to post any money towards, with the regulator towards abandoning and reclaiming a site, unless you get to a point where your production is less than your estimated liabilities, which many have said, by the time you get to the stage where you're actually being forced to save to address your liabilities, you're insolvent and don't have the money to do so. So that's part of the challenge um, for companies is because even if companies want to start clean it, being proactive and cleaning up sites, what you have is you have um, stakeholders who are saying, why are you spending money that's generating no value for this company to do something that you don't have to do right now when you could be using that money for producing other wells or doing something else that generates value. So the regime hasn't really been designed in a way to date that actually encourages companies to carry out abandonment and reclamation work. Um, part of where the issues really risen for industry is as more and more companies have gone insolvent since 2017, um, those remaining solvent licensees are having to contribute more and more money to the Orphan Well Association to pay to clean up those orphan wells from the insolvent companies. And industry is starting to say, how can I be expected to both address my own liabilities, but clean up everybody else's, which is again, creating further insolvency issues. So I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing with the government's new proposed changes to the liability management framework where they're looking to incentivize cleaning up by requiring companies to spend so much money, um, a percentage of their inactive well inventories deem liabilities every year to actually address abandonment and reclamation, which is intended to encourage companies to either clean up sites or either turn sites back on to production or find some other use for them. Right. We've got another question here. I think we might have time for one more anyhow about the regulatory process and whether it needs remodeling to support repurposing. Um, Julie, I'm going to direct this to you because I understand that, that um, there have been quite a few energy entrepreneurs, let's say, and innovators who have all died on the same hill of a regulatory environment that doesn't allow for repurposing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what that experience has been and, and what sort of 
reformation we'd need of the regulatory process to allow this to happen. Yeah, um, this may be better directed at Keeley, but I'll take a first shot. <clears throat> um, so right now, uh, the regulator, especially the Alberta Energy Regulator, is set up to regulate oil and gas wells um, and oil and gas production. Um, and they're not set up to regulate heat from geothermal or minerals production from lithium um, or hydrogen production. It's a, it's a complicated um, aspect once you start getting into all of these different uses. So if a well becomes a so solar site, is it still managed under the Alberta Energy Regulator or is that under the Utilities Commission? And so um there's a once you cross over into a new use you get into a new a new system of regulatory framework now i know um there's been some conversations around um creating uh i'm going to say a sandbox for opportunities to be explored um but it really takes uh, a lot of conversation and a lot of specificity with respect to each site what you're going to do who's involved uh, and all of that so there's a lot of work yet to be done on sorting out the details this is definitely where devil's in the details um keely may have an additional thoughts and comments on that yeah so so while there's some flexibility within the existing regulatory regimes um at least in alberta they're certainly not set up for these types of activities and so for companies looking to play in this space, you're really forced to try to jam your project in as an oil or gas well, depending on how you want to repurpose it, or else in certain cases, you're looking to go and have your project dealt with outside of the energy regulator, in which case you start facing challenges with the ability of getting your own overlapping approvals when there's existing infrastructure on the site which again adds to the costs and the ability to actually move these projects forward. That said, I have seen some companies who have been able to make new projects work in this space, again, more so in Saskatchewan, but we're starting to see more of these types of projects um, arriving in Alberta. And until we get regulatory regime, you can still make these projects work. It's just a lot more challenging and education that needs to be done with the government and the regulators to try to get your projects approved. Great, thank you. And I'm going to use moderator's privilege here to sneak in one more question, which we'll answer very quickly because it's gotten very popular. Have oil and gas companies, the producers, shown any interest in the problem or identified any solutions? And again, I'm going to bound this as being not the problem of, um, of outstanding liability on on inactive wells but the problem but the issue of repurposing them for new uses so have the producers the oil and gas producers shown any interest in this problem um do you want to take it i have a thing i can say but <laughs> you you say your thing um only that i know that the um lpr effort that low probability receptor effort that's being headed by millennium environmental services with ptac on board has actually brought in uh quite a number of the um, major incumbents who are interested in working on this um there needs to be that that problem of matching up um the asset holder with the purpose who person who wants to do the repurposing, and it has to be a match in terms of the site and everything else. So, so having essentially a buyer and a seller meet each other uh, in, in the marketplace is, is a bit of a challenge, but my understanding is that there are at least uh, some producers who are quite interested in working towards a solution on this. Anything to add? One thing I'll add is what with the most recent downturn and in increase in insolvencies, what we're seeing more of is actually creditors um, and investors coming in and credit bidding and taking on these assets. So the dynamic within who owns oil and gas assets is changing in this province. And I think, especially in this investment capital space, when you have the investment community more involved, um, and access to capital is an issue. I think in that space, you're seeing these new players a lot more open and interested in these types of developments because it does make business sense and it also appeals to their investors' interests in greater diversification mm -hmm. and some environmental focus. Fantastic. Yeah, I want to slide in something as Please well. Please do. 
<laughs> so my experience on this has been yes and no and stronger on the no because it's not scalable yet. Um, so, you know, one site, repurposing one site does not affect their books. Um, it doesn't hit the bottom line. It's not that interesting. Um, and so the solution to getting them more excited about this is scale for sure. So if you could take an entire field uh, and repurpose it uh, all at once, then now we're talking, but one at a time, it's like, it's not worth the paperwork to, to make that happen. Great. Um, so I'm, I want to call on everybody's help once again with one final poll question. Um, we have identified a number of, of things that are problems and the question for you is really where should we be focusing our efforts? How can the EFL or other organizations provide the greatest value? You can choose up to two of these things. What should we be working on in your mind in terms of trying to move this forward? It is interesting to me to see that can't really help hasn't made it onto the screen yet. That's probably good. <laughs> it's, it's good for us to test our, uh, our self yeah. though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's, I'm uh, interested that it's, it's coming up with almost half about the regulatory barriers because that is the, the point at which we actually started this project, wasn't it, Julie? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's easy to get distracted though by other factors. Yep. <laughs> that one feels hard. <laughs> yeah. Can we leave this poll up on the screen so that, that people can continue weighing in? And, and Keely, do you have any last words? We, we, I had written down here, Keely, rousing and exciting, but still very brief conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Just that I want to, on behalf of all of us, thank everyone for attending today. I think awareness and discussion is the first step to making progress on this both, I wanna say issue and also amazing opportunity. And I hope those in the industry or in this space will continue to discuss and explore opportunities on how we can move this forward and talk to your elected officials as well on how we can all work to make this easier, easier so that we can generate value from what right now for many is just a huge liability that um, not only is it not generating value, it's creating tons of headaches for municipalities, landowners, even the regulator and other stakeholders who have to deal with this issue every day. Great, that was rousing and brief, well done. Julie, <laughs> final words. Oh, I'm just thrilled. It's so great to uh, have this many people engaging in this dialogue. Um, so please, please attend our next session with Mark Hopkins and Emma Gammons on uh, energy transition in the arts uh, coming up on September 15th again at noon. Um, and thanks again to Calgary Economic Development for uh, sponsoring our session and uh, look forward to seeing many of you back in the future. Thanks a lot everyone.